wasn't much of a landscape in terms of regulatory. Uh, this has evolved very quickly. Um, and uh, it has evolved because the FAA has really stepped up its actions. Um, first of all, let's talk about uh, small uh, unmanned aircraft systems, which is what we're really talking about here. Um, they, the FAA, first of all, considers unmanned aircraft to be aircraft. They fly in the national airspace, and therefore they're subject to FAA rules and regulations. Now, while the large uh, unmanned aircraft, or drones, I know we're going to use the word drones, but it's really hard to explain, so I'm like, if we can use them. Um, for <coughs> uh, research in the Arctic, for crop dusting, for, for uh, uses that, uh, that we're not going to really talk about today, it's just, a uh, small um, unmanned aircraft that I think are of interest to, to you, to the infrastructure community. So right now, the FAA limits authorizations uh, to flights below 400 feet. Um, and also, as Kevin mentioned, to flights that are within visual line of sight. Uh, which basically means that you need to be able to, uh, to see both your aircraft as well as other entering aircraft, manned aircraft. Uh, without the aid of uh, anything beyond maybe your glasses or contact lenses. So under the current la regulatory landscape, first of all, hobbyists can fly uh, within certain parameters that are listed under the statute. A hobbyist is somebody who is not, provide, not flying for commercial purposes. Uh, and, and what that means is, even if you as a hobbyist have, a, have an unmanned aircraft, you can't then take it to work and use it as part of your job. It, that is not allowed yet under the rules. Public operators are uh, essentially government operators, whether that's federal, state, local, law enforcement, military. They have their own process under which they get approvals from the FAA. And then finally, for business to you, are the commercial operators. Commercial operators must get FAA approval to operate an unmanned aircraft. And there's a couple of ways to get that approval. Kevin mentioned the Section 333 exemption process, which is essentially a waiver process um, from existing manned aircraft rules um, that don't really make sense in the unmanned aircraft arena. So for example, there's no way that an unmanned aircraft, this little guy, is going to carry an operations manual in its cockpit because there's no cockpit. Um, those, those types of rules and regulations uh, need to be addressed under this exemption process. Or, if you want to fly them for research and development purposes, the FAA, uh, you can ask the FAA for a special airworthiness certificate in the experimental category. Um, those tend to be more restricted, and they can only be used for R&D or training purposes. Um, now, earlier this year, the FAA issued its Notice of Proposed Rulemaking. John brought copies of uh, this summary that the FAA released of its notice of proposed rulemaking, I'm not going to go over it. I don't know where they are. They're in the back of the room if you're interested in seeing them. Um, but it, in essence, uh, this would, it proposes the final rules for operation of unmanned aircraft. And I'm not going to go through everything that they will require, but there are some highlights. Uh, for example, the FAA proposes to permit only daytime operations uh, and within visual light of sight uh, for the time being. And uh, the FAA pr proposes to prohibit flying over any persons not directly involved in, in the operations themselves. And although it originally looked like the FAA was going to require that the operators have pilot licenses, which they do currently require for those that have exemptions, in the notice of proposed rulemaking, as Clint mentioned, um, the FAA is, is proposing to simply require that an operator pass an aeronautical knowledge test instead. And finally, um, the FAA has also asked whether it should have even more flexible rules for, some, for a category called micro unmanned aircraft, which weigh less than 4.4 pounds. Now, until the FAA adopts its final rules, which we expect will happen sometime in the next 18 months to two year period, anyone operating an unmanned aircraft will have to do so via either the exemption process or the experimental certificate process. Which brings us back to the Section 333 exemptions. Now, this slide gives you basically the, the part of the act that Section 333 is part of and 
um, the legal rundown for why they're authorized to do it, but I'm going to skip it. Um, so, if you want to operate an unmanned aircraft to inspect a tower, for example, you will need to get this exemption. To get one, you'll need to describe the design and the operational characteristics of the particular unmanned aircraft you plan to use, how you propose to operate it safely, safe, safely both to other aircraft as well as to people and property on the ground. Any procedures that you will implement, such as pre-flight inspections, maintenance, and repair, um, the spectrum and the equipment you're planning to use with the unmanned aircraft, and you have to show that you're meeting the FCC's rules. The qualifications of your pilot, um, and, you know, what are you going to use it for? Your maximum speed and altitude, you're not going to fly within five miles of an airport, and so on and so forth. Now, once you get this exemption, um, you must obtain, uh, and Kevin mentioned this, a certificate of waiver or authorization, uh, also known as a COA. And that is, uh, you get that from the um, FAA's air traffic organization, and that is what finally allows you to operate your unmanned aircraft. So the FAA's notice, uh, I mean, the FAA's been going through this exemption process for a year or so, um, and it has received approximately 900 petitions at this point. Um, it has actually granted 244 exemption requests because since last Friday it has granted an additional 20. So the FAA has really started to speed up its authorizations process. And these, authorization, these are uses, are the general uses for which uh, the FAA has been granting these exemptions. Like I said, while they had, they had kind of a slow start granting their exemptions, the FAA has really picked up the speed and has adopted procedures to streamline its review and grant processes. So for example, the FAA has taken two actions that are really going to greatly increase the speed and the ease with which you'll be able to fly on main aircraft. The first is the FAA has announced that it, will, it has adopted a blanket certificate of waiver or authorization or COA, which basically means if you get an exemption from the FAA and you fly under 200 feet during the day within visual line of sight, not within five miles of an airport, you are already authorized to fly it. So all you got to do is get the exemption, meet the 200 and below parameters and all the other parameters, and you can start flying your own main aircraft. That actually cuts back significantly of some of the time that it takes the FAA to authorize your flights. The second is that the FAA is now doing what's called a summary grant process, where if you file an application that meets all of the parameters that someone else already got in an exemption grant, they'll just grant it without going through their longer process. So what, what that's going to mean, and that's why the FAA is starting to significantly increase the number of, of grants, is uh, you can get your grant well within the 120 days that the FAA says it takes them to give you a, an authorization. Finally, just a quick note on privacy. There are no federal rules or regulations that address privacy. There are multiple states throughout the country that have laws that address unmanned aircraft and privacy. Most of them are really about surveillance and, and law enforcement use of unmanned aircraft, but some of them do address commercial and private use of, of aircraft. It's good to know what your particular state or locality says with regard to privacy. Um, nonetheless, at the federal level, President Obama signed a presidential memorandum um, instructing mild agency, the National Telecommunications and Information Administration, to uh, run a multi-stakeholder process to put together best practices for privacy, transparency, and accountability. Um, and those processes will get started very soon. Um, why is it important? It's important because one of the barriers to widespread commercial adoption of unmanned aircraft is the perception that unmanned aircraft are going to violate consumers' privacy um, and or safety. So that is my quick review of the regulatory landscape for unmanned aircraft systems.